You're listening to The Whole Church Podcast. Our efforts to educate and unite the church are made possible thanks to our sponsors on Patreon. Please consider joining them for $3 a month at patreon.com forward slash The Whole Church Podcast, where you'll get access to our extra bonus content like our Whole Church News segment, where we discuss the news and current events of the whole church around the globe today. John 17, verses 20 through 23, Jesus is praying. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me, so that they may be made completely one, that the world may know you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Uh, Reverend Justin Coleman Jesus is praying to the Father here, and he asks his followers to be one, the same way that him and God the Father are one. If the Trinity is all just one being, how is it possible for us to be united the same way they are? It's a great question. You know, really what I think uh, the question evokes in my mind is how Jesus is adding texture to our Trinitarian theology and our theology of creation, particularly mm-hmm. a Trinitarian theology of creation. So we are now reminded that we were created from a relationship. Mm-hmm. When you look all across creation, uh, the the narrative of creation that we see in uh, the Bible or the narratives of creation that we see <laughs> in the Bible, but also what we can observe in our visible world. What we see all around is exquisite mutuality. Mm. And so this, this triune being that is uh, in God's self a relationship created in all of creation reflects relationship. And so this is how our theology moves. It moves from the point of relationship. In fact, anytime you you find a theology or uh, a dogma that seems to be divorced from this exquisite mutuality, this exquisite relationship, it's likely going to get something wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when yeah. our uh, theology is takes into account and, and moves from a place of relationship, we're more likely to get it right because we're closer to not only this creative intent of God, but we're closer to God uh, when (laughs) we think in those ways. Hey everybody, welcome to The Whole Church Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Joshua Knoll. I, I am lacking my partner, the greatest co-host of all time, TJ Tiberius One Blackwell. He will be missed, but to, to make up for it, I have one of the greatest guests of all time. Uh, I, I've actually only met him in person once, and automatically I'm like, this is just one of my favorite people. Such a cool guy, great personality. As you heard in the the before intro, powerful speaker, powerful thinker, Reverend Justin Coleman, pastor of the United Methodist Church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you. It is a delight to be here. And if the Lord will forgive you for saying all those nice things about me, perhaps the Lord <laughs> will forgive me for enjoying it so much. <laughs> yeah, it, it is It is rare to me that I meet someone that I, you can kind of feel it in your spirit where you're like, oh, no, this this guy gets it. This guy gets it. And uh, let, me, let me tell you, this guy gets it, everybody. I am excited to let you guys know that we are launching a fundraiser. I know you guys love hearing that. You, you've already heard it, hopefully, but uh, we have a some shirts we're trying to sell. They got a colorful frame, at the hashtag one church on the front. Bax has the podcast name, just black shirt. Pretty simple design. You can get a t-shirt, you can get a long sleeve shirt, you can get a tank top if you want. All sales are going to go to helping us fund our new website or the convention we're hoping to have next year, which will also be a lot of fun. You guys should be getting promo codes for that soon. So, you know, maybe support us. That that would help. (laughs) And, of course, I always like to start the show off with my favorite form of unity. I I don't know if you know this, but uh, the greatest unity you can have with a fellow brother of the Lord is um, it's it's called silliness. Just when you're being downright goofy. And 
Today, today's is a fun one, uh, and I'll just be transparent. It was inspired by my dog. Uh, <laughs> if you were to recreate Dumbo, the movie, <laughs> and the character was to be any animal other than an elephant, still have huge ears to fly, which animal would you choose? If you don't know, I have a beagle. When he was a puppy, he would jump off the couch, and his big ears would flop through the sky. <laughs> So I'm just I'm going to say beagle. I want to see Dumbo made with a beagle with giant flapping ears to fly. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You know, it's it's really a fun question because, you know, this whole idea of, of the elephant flying is about defying stereotypes. And but I, so I don't know about that, but I, I love this idea of the ridiculousness uh, of it. And so I think <laughs> seeing a a flying giraffe. Oh, that would be one of the most ridiculous and hilarious things (laughs) to see. (laughs) I almost envision instead of the big ears, though, he's like rotating his head like a propeller. (laughs) Oh, man, that's uh, that's great. That's great. Great. uh, Great. Solid answer. (laughs) Um, So uh, (laughs) moving on to other forms of unity, but past past the the great silliness that that we are able to share today. (laughs) Um, One thing we found that really helps with church unity is getting to know one another's stories in the church. Um, Would you mind kind of sharing with us just a general overview or snapshot of what's your testimony and story of how you became the great Reverend Coleman? I don't know about the great, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you the story. So, you know, my uh, growing up, my family was a kind of a uh, Christmas and Easter and a couple times in between church uh, going family. My um, parents were uh, committed to the Christian faith. Um, we were part of a, a large uh, African-American Baptist church in Houston, Texas, that uh, where the pastor had really been a, uh, a force in, in Houston uh, during the civil rights movement. And a great church, love the church, but it was like 45 minutes away from our house. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, waking up uh, young children, young boys to get, uh, you know, put together in their suits and clip on bow ties <laughs> and things like that, uh, going to the early service and driving 45 minutes. It really wasn't <laughs> wasn't the thing my parents wanted to do uh, every Sunday. And... Um, so my journey in faith really began in earnest uh, in middle school when I, for uh, reasons that I will attribute to the Holy Spirit, uh, looked up and saw the King James Bible, family King James Bible sitting on the bookshelf. Nice. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to start reading this thing. And I'm going to start in the New Testament. I'm going to start with Matthew chapter 1. No idea why I determined <laughs> to do that. And I'm going to read at least a chapter a night every night until I read through the entire New Testament. And I did that and did that twice, in fact, and then started in Genesis and and, and kept on moving through. And that's really where I encountered God. That's where I encountered Christ. Um, it was also in the midst of that time that one of my friends who I uh, was a year younger than me in school. We were still in middle school. Uh, we were in band together. I played saxophone. He played trumpet. His father was pastor of the uh, Methodist church right outside our neighborhood. And so he said, come on, dude, come to youth group with me. And eventually I started to go. I asked my parents to drop me <laughs> off uh, at uh, youth group. And that began to be like an every Sunday thing for me. And then I started to ask them to drop me off on Sunday mornings uh, as well. Again, I'm in like seventh grade here, uh, uh, seventh and eighth grade doing this. Got an early start. Yeah. And uh, and sometimes my parents would go with me. Sometimes they didn't. Um, I remember reading about Jesus's baptism and going downstairs and saying to my dad, hey, um, I want to be baptized. This is to fulfill all righteousness and Jesus (laughs) did it. So I need to do it. And dad said, that's fine, uh, son, uh, but we're not going to do it in a Methodist church. We're going to our Baptist church so we can get it done (laughs) right. Uh, And then you can continue on in this Methodist journey. (laughs) So, uh, so that's what I did. And then, you know, in high school began to feel this, uh, this tug in my heart and um, my um, 
my pastor encouraged me to preach uh, part of the youth Sunday sermon. You'd always have like two yeah. students who would do a sermon and and you figured you might get a solid 12 minutes out of both <laughs> of them. <laughs> um, and so it was me and the pastor's son who, who preached the, the combined sermon. Uh, and I preached on the, the person, power, and presence of the Holy Spirit. That was my topic. Wow. And uh, in that time of prayerful research and, and scripture study leading up to that six to 10 minutes that I offered, um, I felt uh, this sense of call in a very profound way that I couldn't shake and preached that sermon. Um, a, a dear uh, woman in the church at the end, kind of in the receiving line, um, uh, I, I felt that she was an older woman at the time. She's probably like, you know, 10 years <laughs> older than I am now uh, <laughs> or something. But, but she said, uh, she took my, uh, took my arm and said, you should consider being a preacher when you grow up or when you're wow. old. And I said, yes, ma'am, that's what I'm going to be. And, and it just came out of my mouth without really even needing to think about it. It was the first time I'd verbalized it out loud or, or truly acknowledged it <laughs> for myself. Wow. And how old were you then? So I was between my sophomore and junior year of high school at this point. Wow. Okay. Pretty early on. <laughs> yeah, early on. And it, it and in that afternoon, I, I brought my uh, parents into our living room and said, hey, mom, dad, um, I know I've been talking about maybe like going to a, um, a healthcare profession or, or something like that, but I really feel called to be a pastor or a preacher. And, and I was really worried <laughs> about what they, how, how they were going to respond. And, um, and my dad said, um, you know, he kind of looked to the side and, and for a bit. And then he said, uh, son, whatever you do, I want you to work hard and do the best you can. I mean, that was it. Wow. <laughs> and oh, that's ever, solid advice though. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Really solid advice. And, um, and ever since, uh, that's where my Heart was uh, wow. set, went to uh, undergrad uh, at uh, Southern Methodist University, mostly because every preacher I'd known had gone to SMU, uh, to the seminary that's there. And I thought, well, <laughs> yeah. I want to go to an undergraduate institution that is close by that energy so I could observe it and yeah. and maybe even interact with little bits and pieces of it as an, as an undergrad. And... Um, and one of my nicknames in in, uh, in uh, college was Rev. I mean, my gosh, you go into college and your nickname <laughs> oh, is Rev. It really sets a tone. Yeah, that's a <laughs> yeah, that's a man. That's that's pretty cool though. So so yeah. pretty early on, you you kind of on this path. Um, so I, I don't know why my, my brain came here, and this is not a question that I was planning on asking. It's just kind of random, really. You were talking about the first sermon you ever preached. And the first one mm -hmm. I ever remember that I preached was uh, to a youth group. And it was kind of about um, self-worth, you know, loving yourself before you love your neighbor as yourself kind of stuff and being made in the image of God, all that. And, and I feel as though e even now, that's still a message that I need to hear, you know, it's almost mm -hmm. like I was telling everybody the message I needed almost. Does that, does that ever creep in on like some sermons every now and then? Is that something that you encounter a lot or... <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that when you preach a sermon, um, you're half preaching to yourself, uh, yeah. <laughs> at least half <laughs> preaching to yourself, in that this is a God, a word that God has given you for you and the community that you are in ministry in the midst of. Um, and so, you know, even thinking back to that, that first sermon, um, it was about relationship. We started this podcast talking about uh, <laughs> relationship and this this sense of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. God so determined to be radically with us that this spirit would dwell. God's very own spirit would dwell within us. I mean, I couldn't Man. think of anything more powerful uh, than that. You know, another part of that testimony was I'd really... And I thought about going into medicine or, or even things like law or politics, all these things that were swirling in my head as a 
as a early high schooler, I really wanted the power to to change the world in a positive way. And I mm-hmm. remember reading Acts 1, 8, and it just being seared into my soul. You shall have power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in all Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I thought, gosh, I'd been leaning on a kind of intrinsic power that was really built um, coming from myself. Um, but if, if I really want to see this world transformed for good, it's God's power that's going to do it. And I want to be a witness oh, to that. That is in, in a weird way, it's all, it's almost like flipped of some of my testimony where I grew mm. up Pentecostal, right? So, you know, I'm very familiar with Acts 1, 8 and, you know, the power of the spirit. <laughs> and I almost had it in my head that the only way to do good is in ministry. And as you know, that, which is, you know, I had some preaching uh. and I still feel the call to preach, but not to pastorship, if that makes sense. Yes. And uh, now, now I am looking at, at becoming a lawyer because I see the good I can do as a Christian in a different vocation. And it's just, it's funny because, you know, I, it's almost as though God intentionally set you up to flip, to flip it. Right. So, you yeah. know, that this isn't of you. So God's like, I'm, I'm going to set you up thinking this way just so I can, I can flip it on you. <laughs> that is, and, oh, and I yeah. think we see that a lot in scripture too. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So, so tell me about the church you're at now. What's, what is unique about the, the church you're preaching at currently? So University of United Methodist Church is a place where kinship, we talk a lot about kinship. Kinship is shaped by the Trinity, uh, and it's a place where everyone is genuinely welcome and every voice is invited. Um, we are a place of what we fondly call humorous orthodoxy. Hmm. Okay. Um and just to unpack that uh, a little, um, we believe in, in laughter and joy and being so nice. uh, lighthearted <laughs> and being uh, serious without the need to dogmatically double down yeah. on certain kinds of um, beliefs. Now, we, we are in many ways... Uh, classically orthodox when it comes to core tenets of the Christian faith. But part of this idea of of humor to me is an openness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, and we try to keep an open enough posture as we listen to uh, the Holy Spirit to, uh, to be uh, convicted and to allow those core beliefs texture to be added by the Holy Spirit. You know, one of the things that I think happens is, and I know this goes beyond your question, but one of the things, ways that we get in trouble sometimes as theologians is you come up with a, a, an idea, an articulation of a theological belief, and you double down, and then you've got to defend it. And so you kind of continue to double down, and unintentionally, you move away from God's revelation <laughs> sometimes when we do that rather than move uh, toward it. Yeah. I, uh, I have found the words I don't know to be some of the most freeing, yes. powerful words to me. <laughs> you know, I, I did, I, you know, I used to do a lot of that of defending and doing all these jumping jacks and, and much like the Pharisees, right? You come up with all these other theologies, all these other rules to reinforce your original thought. And eventually you get to this thing that's unrecognizable. To yes. the Bible's version. And it's like, oh, okay, well, yeah, I, I really like, I like the, the humorous. That's a, <laughs> that's a good touch. It's a good touch. And, and I feel as though the United Methodist church from what I hear dr- kind of, kind of saddles a lot of these lines, right. Of, yes. of, uh, you know, super orthodox, but also openness, uh, you know, yes. ki- kind of liberal, but kind of not, <laughs> you, you, yeah. know, you know, it's kind of, it, it's, it's in the sweet spot. Maybe you'd say, <laughs> Depending on who you're talking to, I guess. I agree. I mean, there's a there's a book for anyone who's interested uh, by Paul Chilcote titled Recapturing the Wesley's Vision. And in mm. this book, he talks about the conjunctive nature of Wesleyan thought. It's this and this. I mean, he was Wesley, as he was uh, um, thinking about theology, would take from the Eastern and the Western church. You know, he'd think about mm. the pulpit and the table. He'd, so there were all these conjunctives oh, yeah. that really flavored uh, his 
thinking and I really think shaped the Methodist church. Yeah. Uh, we have a friend of the show, uh, Keno Kennedy. He's from the AME Zion church. Mm-hmm. And he, he really challenged some of my own thinking where I always say, you know, churches were either tradition or scripture. He's like, Oh, well actually, you know, Methodists have the fourfold. I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. Come again? <laughs> so, you know, it really opened my mind a lot. So get, getting into this, uh, one thing we like to do, and then kind of break it up a little bit, a little bit of fun, a little bit of humorous. Mm-hmm. Uh, we like to help our listeners get to know your beliefs by doing what we call the speed round challenge. Um, I typically am not allowed to dictate this. This is typically TJ's because I go on like I'm doing currently. <laughs> um, the rules of it, you have to answer these questions in one sentence or less. I'm not allowed to ask any follow-up questions, which is particularly hard for me. (laughs) Uh, Do you think you can take the challenge? I think I can take the challenge and might try to be a proper theologian and have some really compound sentences, but we're going to, we're going to give it a go. Perfect. 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 We, we, uh, we get asked uh, whether semicolons are allowed. (laughs) It's fine. Sure. Okay. Here we go. Starting now. Who or what is God? love nice what is the significance of baptism initiation into the family of god okay what is the significance of the eucharist or the lord's supper a grace-filled meal where christ is the host and the table includes everyone who has is or will ever commune with god Hmm. man i wish i was allowed follow-up questions (laughs) what do you believe about biblical inerrancy I believe in biblical infallibility. Okay. Well, I have to leave that one alone, I guess. <laughs> what authority do you believe church tradition has? Church tradition is the living faith of the dead that always resonates into the present. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Do you believe in the continuation of the gifts of the Spirit? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Hmm. Does your church practice speaking in tongues? There are people who perhaps practice the speaking of tongues privately. We don't have this time in the midst of a worship service where there is a speaking of tongues and translation uh, or, uh, of, of that. Okay. What do you believe about predestination? Methodists have not been high up on predestination traditionally. Nice. How many, if any, of the seven sacraments does your church practice? And I can read them off if you need. I don't know. We practice baptism and communion. We believe in two sacraments. And you might say that the additional five, we think of those practices being, we practice them sacramentally, though they're not sacraments. Hmm. Solid answer. Solid answer. All right. Well, that was that was it for the speed round. You aced it. I struggled. Um, okay. You know what? Yeah. Now that it's over. <laughs> <laughs> infallibility instead of inerrancy. What is the difference? Absolutely. So this idea of uh, infallibility is that scripture contains everything necessary for salvation. It is mm-hmm. infallible okay. in that. Whereas inerrancy uh, believes that Historically and scientifically, Scripture is precise. Mm. And for anyone who's ever been a really serious reader of the Bible, um, <laughs> and uh, and I, um, I've led a lot of in-depth Bible studies where we go cover to cover. Uh, there's some great resources like Disciple Bible Study and Covenant Bible Study groups like that that... Um, uh, curricula like that, that journey through the whole Bible and, um, or even in the Bible in 90 days reading program, my church has yeah. done from time to time, folks will say, look, it said this here and this here, and they don't, this doesn't line up. <laughs> yeah. So Just how is it inerrant? Term. I'd All say, right. well, no, 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 <laughs> let's not go inerrant. Let's go infallible. Okay, so let, let me let me throw this at you just just out of curiosity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Trimper Longman, been on the show before, great guy. Mm-hmm. He writes a book, The Controversies of the Old Testament, something like that. I might not have the exact title right, but the way he defines biblical inerrancy in that book, he says the Bible has no error in what it is trying to say. Yes. Is that 
So, and so I think that is, so this is um, what it sounds like. And I haven't read the book. And so I, yeah. you know, want to be, <laughs> um, uh, I don't want to, uh, to over speak here when I've not read it, but it sounds like he's trying to take, make inerrancy work. I mean, people critique inerrancy yeah. all the time these days, and uh, he's trying to make it work uh, by using the a definition that I or others might use in saying the Bible is infallible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I find a lot, of, a lot of stuff like that. I, I tend to, whatever you want to call it, I tend to agree with that. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like uh, clearly when there's different genres of literature, there's all these different things to consider. You have to kind of do a little bit of work to figure out what the Bible's intending to say. Once right. you get that, I'm like, yeah, no, that, that is what truth is. Okay. So the giant elephant in the room, we're going to go, we're going to go there. Yes. Uh, the United Methodist church is kind of facing a split right now concerning different ideas around affirming same sex marriage in the church. Mm -hmm. um, what can you tell us about the split and, or whether it's occurring or not? Cause I still kind of, am like, is it happening? Cause yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, where, where do you stand on this? Yeah. Well, this language around, um, in our book of discipline, uh, which is our you know book of doctrine and, and discipline, as it used to be called, uh, there's some language in there that says that the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. And then there are some related, there's related language in there that offers restrictions around the ordination of self-avowed practicing homosexuals. This is the language that's in the book. And it also offers restrictions around marriage. So this language added to the book of discipline in the 70s and uh, has been um, contended. Uh, there's been contention around it since. Um, and uh, certainly over these last uh, 10 to 20 years, there's been quite a bit of, of tension building up in the church mm -hmm. and, and thoughtful disagreement. I mean, there has been disagreement in there that has been uh, less thoughtful from time to time, but there are scholars that have done work parsing over uh, passages of scripture that are in question uh, asking uh, questions around social context beyond that. I mean, all we, we, we're interpreters of, of mm -hmm. scripture and uh, Methodists have generally uh, not uh, subscribed to a more flat footed. Uh, I mean, that's not, it's not as generous. It could be, <laughs> we don't, we don't uh, subscribe to a plain sense reading. Yeah. Of, of scripture. We recognize that every time you talk about scripture, it is interpretation and interpretation has a, uh, a cultural lens. Um, it has racial ethnic lenses it's around social location. There's so much that goes into uh, interpretation. And so we have had a great uh, increasing disagreement over these passages around uh, human sexuality. And so there's this split that has begun. And here at the end of this calendar year, there will be a number of churches that are officially disaffiliating from the United Methodist Church. Uh, in some annual conferences, it is uh, a few churches. In some annual conferences, it's a majority uh, of, mm. of churches that, uh, that are uh, disaffiliating, um, and and so now we see the the first real expressions of this split. Uh, certain churches disaffiliating to become independent churches, and certain ones uh, reaffiliating with other denominations. Uh, one of which being uh, the newly formed Global Methodist Church. Huh. Okay, and where do you mind me asking where you and your church stand on the on this oh. issue? I'm glad for you to ask. Um, our church, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you this. Our church has on its front lawn some installation art. Now, we're a very uh, traditional-looking uh, church in downtown 
uh, Chapel Hill. And we've got this installation art that has these rainbow doors that say, uh, God's doors are open to all <laughs> across all right. the place. <laughs> and so that's where we are. And so we would be ones who would encourage the removal of the restrictive language that is there in the Book of Discipline. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, it's it's interesting. There, there have been, in my opinion, I should say, there have been a lot of emotional arguments on both sides that I'm like, okay, I just... We don't have time for, oh, that's icky or, but it feels right. right. Yeah, I don't have time for that. But there's Absolutely. also been, you know, like you said, like some really incredible intellectual disagreements on both sides that I, me being me, I'm like, man, I'm not smart enough to, <laughs> to you know, overwrite either of these sides. <laughs> these guys are way smarter than me. Um, I will say that I am very glad that there will not be a theology, a theology test when I get to heaven. I know there is Amen. plenty of things that I will most likely fail on. So uh, I, I'm glad that's that's not a thing. <laughs> yes, me yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. So how amicable is this split? Is this like both sides are like, yeah, okay, we we need to we need to break mm. up. <laughs> you know, it's it's been amicable amicable in some places, and in uh, some places it's really not. There has been um, uh, harsh rhetoric, at least I believe, that has been. Um, uh, harsh uh, that has not characterized yeah. the other party in generous ways. Um, and this is in part what happens when there is separation, yeah. when there is divorcing, you almost have to build up some energy so that you can press back and create distance. Yeah. Um, this happens in uh, not only uh, as it relates to churches it relates to individuals or someone when they're leaving a job or whatever. You kind of build up those mm -hmm. justifications. Yeah. And this is why I'm going to do this. And this is why I just can't stand this anymore. And that gives you energy to propel yourself away from something into something else. And, uh, and often over time, once you've cooled off a little bit and, <laughs> and developed a little bit more perspective, you might say different things than you did in the heat of the moment. And so I'm seeing some of this unfortunate uh, energy that is meant to help people create more rigid distinctions and rigid boundaries so that they can justify uh, yeah. the separation. Now, how, how possible do you think it is for churches who disagree or have split over this issue to come together and, in Christian unity still? I mean, is it going to be this one issue is the deal breaker? We can't come together anymore? Well, over the history of even the, the Methodist church, not a Methodist church, there have been splits and, and comings together again. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I have high hopes around uh, that. Um, you know, it, it, even when I think about the um, denominations that existed uh, prior to this more recent Methodist split, you say, well, in a hundred years, will we still believe it makes sense to be as separate as we are now? And this is not just talking about members of the Methodist fold, uh, mm -hmm. even among other denominations. I mean, will it make sense for us to be as uh, separate as we are now in a hundred years or in 200 years. Uh, I hope it won't. I really, I yeah. really do. And, you know, um, the apostle Paul talks about the unity of the spirit, capital S spirit um, and faith and uh, knowledge of God. He talks about unity in the love of God. Um, you know, Jesus uh, talks about uh, loving one another uh, so that the world would know that we are his disciples. I mean, you commit yourself to loving relationship. I mean, if yeah. you commit yourself to it. It helps to um, clarify and helps to resolve a great many um, tensions. Another way to say about that is that we're when we're in committed, loving relationship with others, it makes nonsense out of our divisions. Yeah, 
Yeah, that makes sense. I um the church I grew up in, my parents' church, I still have pretty close ties there. I don't attend right now. I am attending more Lutheran churches, but the mm-hmm. so the church I got a prophecy. It's a Pentecostal church and it's split from the Church of God. And now they're at this point where they almost make jokes about it. There really is no major difference between the two. Right. It's just, uh, you know, at this point they have different leaderships, so they're not going to become one church all of a sudden, but work together all the time. But at one point there was a split that had to do with the prophecies of Revelation and this being the prophesied over church, which is church got a prophecy, right? And it was a big deal. And then that guy passed away and theologies mm-hmm. have changed and morphed over time. And now it's kind of like, you know, it's almost like we, we joke about the fact that we're not the same church, basically, you right. know? <laughs> yeah. So well, one thing, our, our mutual friend, Pastor Will, been on the mm-hmm. show before, a Lutheran pastor there in uh, Chapel Hill. Uh, he mentioned that you started the series of meetings, different churches in your area, to kind of help discuss the strategy dealing with COVID and later with the Black Lives Matter movement, all the stuff that's happened over the last couple of years. And some of the meetings are still ongoing, I think mm-hmm. is what my understanding. Yes. What can you tell me about that? How, what gave you this idea? How did you start it? I mean, that's that's awesome. Well, it, it, it has been awesome, and it has created a wonderful um, – really family uh, um, from the experience. Um, We started because this pandemic um, was uh, rolling across (laughs) our globe. And this was before, just before we went into lockdown. And so I um, uh, had a medical professional um, at our church who was part of the Mm -hmm state uh, and then national disaster response team around COVID. And so I said, hey, could you just come and talk to us about what we're looking at here? <laughs> yeah. And so we invited uh, folks from uh, denominations all across town and 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 it was indeed interfaith as well. Um, our uh, local rabbi uh, came. And so it was this great gathering of folks to really listen and then discern together how we wanted to respond as a faith community, uh, as a broad faith community, so Mm -hmm. that there would be this public witness from these churches and these uh, communities of faith uh, as a block. And so it showed this tremendous unity uh, uh, across our town. And we met weekly. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, and for most of the pandemic, we met weekly. And it's only been within this last year that we've moved to monthly meetings. Man. Yeah. And well, one thing I really, I really liked about what I heard about this group is it kind of prevented some of the competitiveness. You didn't have one church going, we're going to open. They're not open and unified together. Who's going to be open? Who's not? We're not going to compete over this thing. We're going to, we're going to work together. Incredible. How yes. how did you get everybody? How did you get everybody to agree to that? Because I've met a lot of competitive pastors, and I'm like, how? how? Well, I have as well. I mean, my gosh, I'm a Texan, and <laughs> so I've met a lot of competitive pastors, and I I I was concerned that this could very uh, uh, this could be something that divided the um, body of Christ mm-hmm. in our town more so than unified it, because we've got this this set of of clergy many of whom are new to the town within the last you know five years uh uh, pastor will uh been the longest (laughs) serving um uh person in in the town but most everybody else had arrived uh, as senior pastors within the last the previous five years wow and so i thought gosh um either wedges are going to begin between our communities mm-hmm. for faith. And this is going to be just one more way that uh, the church becomes divided, or this is going to be uh, a time when the church becomes united, perhaps in ways that this town has never seen. That's an awesome testimony too. Um, and, uh, and I'm thankful that we chose the latter. Yeah, me too. Me too. I mean, I think that is how you show the love of God. That's how you be a light on the hill. All that stuff is they'll know you by your love for one another. Right. That's what the Bible says. How, what advice do you have for churches in other areas that might want to get something like that started or, you know, just coming together like that? I mean, yeah, you know, the common cause was really helpful, you know, to, to gather around and say, Hey friends, we are going to 
we're going to work on this together. And you know, a lot of relationship begins that way, working yeah. shoulder to shoulder uh, with one another. And then you really get to know one another along the journey. So I think if you can find a common cause, that is, that's great. I'd say uh, what was also very important in it was, was consistency mm-hmm. of meeting. I mean, even once a month, as we meet now is good, but there are plenty of times when I think, gosh, I know we don't have this broad agenda to be chipping away at uh, each week, but it was so good to see uh, those siblings every week. They really became family for me. I think we became family for one another. And it felt like, like a weekly staff meeting, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> where we were, this, this, this community of peers and it felt like we were one church to me, at least it felt uh, like we were one church awesome. in, yeah. in, you know, multiple locations working yeah. synergistically. Yeah. Uh, go down in the show notes down below, uh, hit the link and buy your hashtag one church t-shirts. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I got to do my plug, but <laughs> no, in, in all seriousness though, I mean, that's it's it's incredible and it's something i found while doing this is meeting with these people it's almost as though the ones that i work with through this show or through systematic ecology that i disagree with the most Mm -hmm. that we find a way to push through that it's almost like you have a deeper connection because of the disagreement yes yeah man it's it's incredible stuff so one thing we do like to ask everybody and uh you know i think that's a great thing i would love more pastors reach out to other churches make that happen but for our regular lay people you know, just average Joe listening to the show. What is a single tangible action, something practical he can go do that would help maintain church unity today? Yes. You know, in some ways, I think some of our lay people are the best at this. Yeah. <laughs> um, in that, you know, clergy feel like, uh, well, I've got to, I've got to tell people what makes us distinct from them Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, because we're asked the question hey what makes you know a methodist this and a baptist this and an episcopalian this and a non-denom this and an interdenom this and they just and we're we're asked to become good at articulating distinction much more than we're asked to articulate unity Mm -hmm. that's just pause and think (laughs) about that for a moment in in what is (laughs) <laughs> requested of us. Uh, talk about what's different more so than what is unitive. Um, but so many of our uh, lay folks, especially those who are, who are, you know, or converted or, or whatever your language is for, they're kind of <laughs> new to the church or just starting to take the church seriously. And, and they say like, what's the big deal? <laughs> it seems to be yeah. uh, when I'm, when I read Jesus, uh, Jesus seems to be trying to erase this sense of us and them. And kind of like Father Greg Boyle says, you know, there's no more us and them. There's just us. That's <laughs> what makes sense. Man. And so I think that uh, tangible ways that uh, lay people uh, can uh, build Christian unity is to continue to reach out uh, to uh siblings in Christ at school or at work or wherever and build those friendships and also build useful collaborations. So you can say, Hey, uh, our church, our community of faith is doing this. Could we work together on it? And, you know, lay people come excited into the pastor's office and say, Hey, (laughs) I've got this connection with these other folks. Could we do something? And even if the pastor's thinking, no, I just kind of want to, for us to celebrate this by ourselves (laughs) <laughs> They're going to meet that passion and say, hey, yeah, let's do it. I actually think that uh, uh, oh, yeah. lay people uh, move into the world as the body of Christ uh, each and every day, already connecting and commingling with uh, Christians in other communities of faith. And so I say, yeah, let's just capitalize on the network that is already there. Okay, so let me ask you then, if everyone listening, started started doing this and we saw more people going into their pastor's office with this passion i mean i have these friends over here we're we're already connected let's let's do this thing together if more lay people started doing that what changes would we see not only in the church but in the world around us 
Well, one, I think we'd see more Christians and less churches. Mm. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> I mean, more Christians and less denominations, at, at least, uh, yeah. is, is how I would uh, put it. Because I think that's compelling. I mean, when people see that collective public witness, they are inspired inside the church and out. Because it feels unbelievable. In a, in a culture yeah. of division, uh, that feels... Um, unbelievable to the point of being miraculous and i think it that kind of behavior presses an engagement that removes that barrier of the us and them and the more you spend time together it feels like just us because in every local church there is theological nuance and and Mm -hmm. and variance in the midst of every single local church on some issues. And and so you tolerate it in your local church as you have these connections with others, you begin to um, tolerate it more fully and say, gosh, you know, there we can we can have some essentials around around who who Jesus is, um, you know, as as Stanley Hauerwas, a Christian ethicist and one of my former professors would say Jesus is Lord and everything else is BS. I'm going to do the short form of it. Um, <laughs> yeah. You, you start to feel that when you connect with oh, yeah. other, other Christians, you know, it's sure. the main thing, the main thing and everything else is a conversation. Love Jesus, love people moving on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so one thing you said, and I'm backtracked just a little bit Yeah. before we, we start wrapping this thing up. Um, you said pastors get asked a lot. What makes you different? But don't get asked a lot. What makes you unitive? What makes your church unitive? Put you on the spot with your own. Oh, your own absolutely, thing. absolutely. I um, this spirit of cooperation and breaking down walls is um, is in me as a as a pastor, uh, as a mm-hmm. as a person, and I have found our church to be enlivened by these kinds of connections uh they just Mm. get it people get excited uh uh, about connecting with other communities of of faith and i think i don't think that's solely because of what i've brought to the church as a as a pastor i uh i like to believe that uh, as people are connecting uh deeply to uh, God's Holy Spirit active in their lives and speaking in their lives. When you start talking about connecting with other Christians, um, that's resonant. Is resonant yeah. because that's the work of the Spirit. The Spirit is saying, amen, yes, I like that. Um, and so I think the Holy Spirit is cheerleading in the souls of folks in our church whenever there is this sense of uh, um, connection and the sense that there might be an expanded impact if we will work with our uh, siblings in Christ who are part of other churches. And man, I'm, um, I'm just so thankful that they really get jazzed by that. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's... Um... That's incredible. And I just, you know, I just kind of want to thank God for that. I know that's that's cheesy, (laughs) but it brings back what you said at the very beginning, very beginning, that same spirit that created relationally is working in us in relations, (laughs) you know, that he wants us to be in relation with one another. I mean, powerful, incredible stuff. Um, man, as, as before we, before we start to wrap up, we always like to do our God moments. It's something TJ always likes to make me go first. This is, I, I am solely in the TJ dictated part at this point. So I will be slightly on, you know, off my rhythm, <laughs> but uh, it's just share something to God done to bless us, challenge us, whatever it may be. Um, since he always makes me go first, I'll go first. <sighs> we are with our other podcast, this yeah. Geology, going through a lot of changes and a lot of growth. And it's a different kind of challenge. You know, typically I feel challenged that, you know, we're on our back foot and we're trying to figure out how to, you know, you know, something in my life is holding me down and how do I get back to normal? But in this point, it's like God's challenging me to go forward, not get back to normal. Mm. And uh, it's a different kind of challenge. So it's like a blessing and a challenge wrapped into one. And I'm 
figuring out how to navigate that as a leader and relying on God's strength to go forward instead of get back. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, uh, it's been a really cool thing God's been doing with us there. What's, uh, what's God been up to with you? Yeah, I can, I can speak uh, about this on, on two different levels. One, um, as a, as a pastor and as a, as a leader, um, there's just been this idea of, of creating a family of churches. Um, the Methodist connection is, well, that's what it's meant to be. The United Methodist connection is meant to be a, a, a broad multi-site family of churches. Mm-hmm. And, and so this question has been in my mind, you know, what does it mean to, to locally create a family of churches within the Methodist churches that are uh, in our geographic uh, area? What does that mean? Um, but beyond that, uh, talking about this group of churches that has been meeting together, you know, since the beginning uh, of the pandemic or before the pandemic, you know, what does it mean for us to be a family of churches uh, together uh, such that we we create a family identity. I mean, what would that mean? Um, not only within uh, my don- denomination, but also um, beyond um, my denomination as well. So that's been that's been one place of of challenge uh, for me that I would extend to others. You know, how yeah. how, how can everyone? Incredible. Think that? Yeah. And then just on the more personal uh, level, you know, I've been thinking about this idea of finding Jesus. People are always talking about, you know, finding (laughs) Jesus. Yeah. Uh, And I've been thinking more about how Jesus finds me, uh, which, uh, which shifts things in my mind, instead of arriving in a situation and say, you know, where's Jesus? No, Jesus is already there. So how is Jesus viewing me right now? What's in Mm -hmm. Jesus's heart for me right now? So, uh, and just that, those questions shift it. Um, uh, quite a bit, and uh, and I find that I can draw near to Christ uh, more quickly as I realize that Christ is already drawn near to me in every situation. I um recently in my church history three class I'm taking mm. a um we were reading John Bunyan's testimony, and he's talking about how he was waiting on God to call him. Right. And he's yes. crying out, begging God to call him. And it, I'm just getting this image of him calling. And I'm like, man, that is so it, in a weird way. It challenged me that no, God, God's actually calling out to us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, like he says, I called out to you. You heard my voice. And I'm like, that, oh, yeah, whole, whole different rabbit hole. We could have a whole nother thing on that one day. <laughs> but guys, uh, if you listen this far, thank you so much for listening. Uh, please consider sharing it with a friend, an enemy or a cousin, as TJ likes to say, um, uh, Make sure you go over to our Patreon, check out our whole church news series where we just talk about the news of what's going on in the church all around the globe today. And um, again, you know, we got those limited time fundraiser t-shirts down in the show notes. Check it out. It's uh, I think it's worth it. Help the show a little bit with our website and all that. And thank you for listening to the Whole Church Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Coming up, we're going to be interviewing Nathan Gilmore, host of the Christian Humanist Podcast. Then we will be talking with Christian life coach Michael Jaquith. After that, we will have a special Christmas bonus episode with Eugene Stutzman, been on the show before, and he's going to be discussing the Watoto ministry in Uganda, Africa. And finally, at the end of season one, Francis Chan will be joining us as soon as he is made aware that he is joining us. (laughs) It's going to happen. Trust us. Thank you for listening to the Whole Church Podcast. Remember, you could always sponsor our show at patreon.com forward slash the whole church podcast. Come back next week where we will continue our efforts to educate and unite the whole church.